So I'm going to read a scene from the middle of the novella. It's called The Visible Filth. What you should know going in is just that Will, the protagonist, has found a phone in a bar after a brawl. He's taken it home until he can bring it back. And uh, the night that he brought it home, he received some strange messages asking for some help. Now, the next day, he's kind of looking through it, looking at some of the pictures. He gave his full attention to the yellow phone. It felt like a conduit of some dark energy, and he felt uncomfortable holding on to it. He placed it on an end table beside the couch and called up the menu. The camera icon pulled his eye toward it as though it exerted its own peculiar gravity. He touched the icon and scrolled over to the picture gallery. There were four saved images in the video file. He stared at them a moment, trying to come to terms with what he was seeing, trying to arrange the world in such a way that would accommodate his own mundane life, the daily maintenance of his ordinary existence, along with what he saw arrayed before him in neat little squares like snapshots of hell. He tapped his finger on the first one so it ballooned to fill the screen. It looked like a close-up shot of a sleeping man's face. He was middle-aged, balding, with a large flat nose. His face was soft and rounded, like the features of a stone carving which had been worn smooth by centuries of wind and rain. There was nothing sinister about this picture. It might be an intimate portrait taken by a lover or a dear friend. The second was the same man from the same angle, but taken from a few feet further away. In this picture, the man was clearly dead, felled by a violent strike to the head. The rounded dome of the man's skull, cropped out of the first picture, was here depicted in the shattered complexity. Bone and brain and blood extruding from the crown like a psychedelic volcano, caught in mid-expulsion. The man was lying on the sidewalk. The blood around his head reflected a disk of overhead light, a street lamp, or a flashlight. The picture had been taken at night. He noticed what appeared to be a wedding band on the man's left hand, which lay palm up, white and plump. The third picture revealed a new setting. This one had been taken indoors under a harsh light. 70s style wood paneling covered the wall in the background. A utilitarian white drafting table occupied the foreground, and resting atop it was the same man's head, severed from its body. It sat, planted it sat planted straight on the table. Someone must have taken the time to balance it, to arrange it just so. The wound in his head was not visible from this angle. No blood marred the scene, save the inevitable blackened ring around the neck. It seemed that some care had been taken to clean the blood from his head, pripping him like a schoolboy for his yearbook photo. A slender red book lay on the table behind it, partially obscured, its, sp its spine facing the camera. Will tried to slide on to the next one, but his fingers had gone numb and the phone clattered to the floor. He experienced a wild and irrational fear that someone had heard him and would see what he was looking at, and he felt an overwhelming shame, as though he'd been caught looking at the most outrageous pornography, or as though these ghastly photographs depicted his own work. Putting the phone back on the table, he closed his eyes and forced himself to calm down. His breath was shaky, his nerves jumping. It occurred to him, abruptly, like some divine communication, that he did not have to look any further. He knew something awful had happened, that a murder of grotesque proportions had been committed and documented, and that any further examination was unnecessary. He should go to the police right now and wash his hands of it. But stopping was unthinkable. He scrolled to the fourth photograph. In this one, someone had gone to work on the head with an almost medical precision and an artisan's hand. Using the killing wound as a starting point, the man's scalp had been sliced into a star pattern and his skin pulled down from the head in, banana, in bloody banana peels. The soft, generous features of his face, which, is, which had suggested to Will only moments ago the close proximity of someone beloved, which suggested both kindness and the passage of time, were obscured now by the bloody undersides of themselves. The skull had been scraped clean, or nearly so. The eye sockets had been scooped hollow. The table beneath the head was festooned with the gory splashes of the artisan's hard labor. Only the video clip remained. Pressing the button was not like scrolling through the pictures. He could not pretend he was carried by momentum. This was a separate choice. It was, it was his second chance to turn away. He pressed play. The video player took a moment to load and then filled the screen with a shaky image of the head on the table. A blare of static shrieked from the phone as someone said something unintelligible. Will tapped the button to lower the volume. 
conscious of the sound intruding into the atmosphere of his apartment like a species of ghost. He checked over his shoulder, a sense of proximity to another person prickling his nerves, and then held the phone close to his face to be assured that he wouldn't miss anything. Shame, fear, and a weird thrill filled his body. Hold it steady, Jesus, a young man's voice. The view stabilized, holding firm on the severed head, which is canting slightly to one side. The fourth picture had already been taken, careful ribbons of flesh suspended like wilted petals over the dead man's face. The top of the skull had been shaved down, leaving a red raw hole just above the temple. A girl stepped into the frame, her back to the camera. She had straight blonde hair, an athletic body. She straightened the head again, held it a moment to make sure it stayed in place. Oh my God, I can feel it, she said, and she jerked her hands away. Get the fuck out of the picture, another girl's voice. She retreated and a calm settled over the image. A slight movement of the camera as a heart pounded hard in the chest, a stifled, nervous giggle. The head shifted slightly, as if it had hurt something and had to turn a fraction to listen more closely. Then it moved again, and something seemed to shift in the darkness of its open skull. Oh shit, high-pitched and genderless. Four thick, pale fingers extended from inside the hole and hooked over the forehead. Someone screamed off camera and the image skewed wildly. The video ended. Will? Fuck! He flipped the phone over, turning to see Carrie standing beside him. Carrie's his girlfriend. He felt slow and disjointed, as though he'd dropped a tab of acid. When did you get home? Just now. She wasn't looking at him, though. What are you looking at? Nothing. I thought you said you were going to turn that into the police. Yeah, tonight. I said I'd do it tonight. Jesus, what time is it? I came home early, skipped math. What are you looking at, Will? I said nothing, just... He stood up and put his arms around her in a belated welcome. There was nothing genuine about the gesture, and she pushed him away, plainly irritated. Give it to me. He shook his head, looking at the ground between them. He could not let her see what he'd just seen. You don't want to see this, Carrie. He felt her staring at him. Is that Alicia's phone? What? No. What does that even mean? You know what the fuck it means. I can't believe this. I can't believe you're still hung up on this. My friends can only be guys, really? What about Steve? This didn't get the rise out of her that he was hoping for. She looked at him calmly and said, what about Steve? He's into you. He wants to fuck you. So what? I'm not fucking him but you want to. No, I don't. You want to check my phone? Want to see if I have any pictures of him on it? Go check it. It's in my purse in the kitchen. Go. He shook his head, but the temptation was real. Was she bluffing? Did she know that he wouldn't do it? What if he surprised her and really did look? What would he find? No, he said, I, I trust you. I wish you trusted me too. I want to trust you. But you're fucking looking at something on some cunt's phone and you're acting guilty as shit. Of course, she was right. Nothing about his behavior signaled anything good. He knew that. He retrieved the phone from the table and placed it into her hand. You don't want to see, he said. You really don't. What is it? I don't know. So she sat down and she opened the files. He watched it all with her a second time. When she was done, she returned it to him, her hand shaking. He stared at her face the way he would a television screen, waiting for something to happen on it, waiting for it to give him something to react to. Is that Garrett, the person who was texting on this last night? That thought hadn't even occurred to him. I don't think so. These were taken earlier. They were already on the phone. Call him. What? No. Then give it to me, I'll do it. He clutched the phone more tightly. He felt as though they were debating opening the cage of a starving tiger. Why, Carrie? It's a bad idea. I want to know if he's still alive. I don't want to think about someone dying like that while you ignored him. Ignored him? He was asking for help. He was begging you. Oh, fuck that, he said, a surge of guilt turning quickly to anger. No one's dead, for God's sake. 
He activated the screen and went back to Garrett's last written text. Please. He summoned Garrett's number and dialed it. Carrie stared at him as he waited for an answer, the phone trilling lightly into his ear. After a moment, it stopped ringing. He brought the phone away from his ear a fraction of an inch, thinking at first that it had been disconnected. But something about the quality of the silence told him otherwise. Hello? Something was alive in that silence. Garrett, hello? It spoke. It sounded broken and wet, like something sliding itself together in a slurry of blood and bones, a tongue testing the border of language. Liquid syllables collided and slipped past each other. It sounded too close, like it was already living in his head. He threw the phone across the room in a reflex of disgust. Carrie's barked cry of shock lost him in the echo of the voice leaking from his ear, like a thread of blood. The phone came apart in two pieces, and Carrie was already racing toward it, leaving him to rub at his ear with the heel of his hand. Tears he didn't even know he was crying, trailing down his cheek. Carrie crouched on the floor, fitting the battery back into the phone, snapping its shell back into place. Was that him? Was that Garrett? She sounded panicked. And why would that be, he wondered, the fear and the disgust of a moment ago settling into a thick soup of anger. She wasn't the one who had to listen to that voice. No, he said. It was nobody. Nobody was there. I'll stop right there. Thanks very much. <laughs>